So take us through this this period then of you know the early '90s and the the hearings in Congress, press conference. Um, I did see a press conference that your mom was at. So apparently, you know, she was convinced to to become involved. She was dramatic. I mean, yeah. she was on the cover of Newsweek magazine, Good Morning America. She, you know, because she went to law school at night right after my dad was lost, and. You know, she, she's a very determined lady, raised six kids all by herself. I mean, and didn't that we had no idea. I mean, truly, it was so much effort the whole family put in um, to try to find out what happened to him. And we didn't know other than we thought he might be alive. We were hoping he was going to walk off the plane. Could you imagine if he walked off that plane? I've now met the guys that were special forces, you know, the original Green Berets. He was flying support for it. That was the VSOG, Special Operations Group. Right. And 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 they have these get-togethers now, these old, older guys now. But And one of them said to me, all these special forces guys would, would not even deign to think that they were as badass as the guys flying them, A1s. Mm-hmm. And... and Always, they said, I'll buy you a drink. And there's no way these special forces guys would allow the A1 drivers to buy a drink, you know, even to this day, wow. you know. And the A1 drivers, no, 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 you guys were it. You guys were on the ground, et cetera. So, so to just give you an idea of the men we lost, these people that could have built our country and made it strong and, and, and real, le- real leaders, right? Not politicians, mm. uh, just... And that, and I, in some ways, I, I, I bemoan the loss of my dad because of that. Mm. that. I mean, he was a true leader. I could tell you stories about that. But so this confluence of events comes. We've got a, a reporter, <laughs> a fellow named Brown, who's famous here now. He's a news reporter, but now he's an anchorman, um, knocking at our door at 9 or 10 at night with a, you know, a photo uh, and, and saying, we've got information that you know your your dad might be alive uh, that, that was the the kickoff to yeah getting that press conference yeah so t- talk talk about the the photo this obviously was a subject of, of great interest so Gladys Fleckenstein says you know would you like to meet with me and I, normally I would have said uh, no thank you <laughs> Right. I mean, it might, you know, because there is a lot of information coming out of Vietnam and, and the Southeast Asia that's not true. And they're unfortunately resurrecting, you know, these the well-meaning. I still get people to this day who come into my office that have, you know, remains, for instance, or information about remains and uh, that want to solve the problem of, of these poor people who don't know what happened to their loved ones. Um or, or trying to, to sell them, you know, that happens as well. Uh, still. And, oh, still, wow. still. Wow. And um, I, 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 but Gladys, she was different, you know. She hears this poor mother who's looking for her son. She said, would you meet me? And I'm like, oh, I don't have time to meet you. Mm. <laughs> okay, I'll meet you. It was a long way away, too. It was like Pomona or Rancho Cucamonga at a Denny's. And um, we had to show our driver's license <laughs> for them to prove that we were, they were, had enough weird encounters that they wanted to make sure we were who we said we were. Um, so we pull out a driver's license to show this little old lady. And she's there with her two sons who are missing their brother. And at that point, too. Jack was with her too. Yeah, Jack was great. Her, 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 her uh, anyway, um, they had this story to tell that they'd, been, they'd received this photograph and there were identifications on the back of the photograph. And it wasn't, it was a copy. It wasn't the original, right, Kathy? I don't, I don't remember that. Um, and Albert Lundy was on the back of that. And I said, oh my gosh, we're, who knows the name of Albert Lundy? He, he hasn't been part of this POW situation at all. Where did that come from? You know, this confluence, mm-hmm. this confluence of information, which as my, uh, which a wonderful captain, uh, retired captain in Marine Corps, 
uh, a gunnery, a gunnery captain, Denny Clark, who is our guardian angel, came. He called me up and he said, "When when after our press conference, he said I can help you. I can make a difference for you to make a difference for the men who were left behind." Uh, he's a Vietnam vet, and uh, God bless Denny. And he also is a fellow who does exhibits for a lot for trials. And right. so <laughs> he blows up because I'm going to where Kathy set up a, a press conference in Washington, DC. Yeah. And I'm on the, I'm getting on the flight. He meets me at the gate with all these trial exhibits that I'm now going to use for my press conference in Washington, which are smoking hot, great exhibits. Um, and I had no it's, idea who this, yeah. I didn't know who he was. I never met him. And yeah. there's all, all of this secrecy involved, right? And I'm like, ah, should I meet this guy or not? Should I give him a photograph or not? Or what's that? now I'm caught up in it. <laughs> and these are the things where you've got the, the photo of your dad around 1970, and then the photo that he did the overlays side by side with the 16 points of comparison or something. Yeah, like that. He did the overlays. He did the, I got to walk the halls of Congress. Because I'd done a fellowship in, uh, called the CORO, C-O-R-O, CORO Fellowship. And part of what the fellowship does is trains you in public affairs. So I knew how to walk the halls of Congress, right? I knew how to do the leverage that I needed to do. I knew that it was amazing. And, as, as, and I don't know, and, and we've tracked it down to the point that I can honestly say I don't believe that photograph was my dad. But what it did do was elevate the issue to the forefront. And, and as Denny said, well, it may not have been your dad, but we sure got a lot of press out of it. <laughs> no, and no I would say just the way the Pentagon handled that photo showed that they were not interested in truly finding the men. They immediately went to disproving the photo and saying it was fake instead of this could this could be legitimate the fingerprints could be legitimate let's let's look into this and see if it leads to a man and i think repeatedly that's what we came back to to say the way this is mishandled is not honoring the men it's they're not about bringing them home and finding them wherever they are they want to end this issue they want to end discussion they want to cut it off and, and so that's, i feel like that's really what the photo helped illustrate and that was our drive to get a senate select committee i mean that was our drive that was the press and it was right in the middle of that that i'm walking the halls of congress and we had this press conference and they didn't think much of it, right? The press didn't, at least in D.C. Um, and so, like, the Washington Post sent a... Style writer. Style writer. A style writer to cover it, right? It was, it was being covered internationally. Who's just but, never had a big story. He's always been on the inside. And he uh, had never had a front page story. And, and, this, and it blows up. You know, so, I mean, we're everywhere. I mean, we're everywhere. But, but this style writer writes the story of his life. And the next morning, he is top of the fold, front page story with yeah. Alpro on the cover of Washington Post. So uh, here I am. I'm staying. I'm sleeping on the floor at my sister's house. She lives in Virginia. And I get up and I'm going into... DC and I'm going to go start knocking on doors, right? Mm. And I'm going to start talk, talking to congressmen. Sure, yeah. And back then, the paper was a big, big deal. And the Washington Post at the metro stations had uh, paper news racks that were 20 news long. 20. And I was on the front page I walk up and there I am, bam, 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 all the way across. <laughs> I'm like, wow, wow, yeah. this is uh, amazing. I, we would say God works in mysterious ways, and this was <laughs> amazing. So I'm like, well, maybe I should buy one of those. <laughs> and I buy five of them. I don't think I had that much money, but um, but it was wonderful because I walked up to I knock on doors. 
And I, I, and they'd say, you have an appointment with the Senator. And I'd say, no. And they go, uh, well, uh, maybe I, are you a constituent? No. And I would go in my briefcase and I'd get this, the Washington post out and I put it in front of the receptionist. And I said, Hey, this is me. And the receptionist goes, yeah, I can tell it's you. <laughs> I said, I'm going to be on Larry King live on Friday night. I'd hate to say when Larry asked me, have senators been cooperative that Senator so-and-so, uh, and actually it was Gore that I, I totally used that line on, wouldn't see me. Mm. Right? Mm. The doors opened faster sure. than you could imagine. And so, yeah. and by the way, Al Gore uh, was a true gentleman and a champion. Once I got past his, he saw me, talked about it. I convinced him. This is mind blowing. That Senate Select Committee vote was going on very close to this time frame, um, and so uh, who, who was the Kelly? Who was the injured? Remember, his arm was all messed up. Senator McCain uh, Dole. Oh, Dole. Yeah, Dole. Dole. McCain and I. I got a story I could tell you, but anyway, Dole voted against the Senate Select Committee, right? Hmm. He voted against it. I'm in the hearing in that room as they're taking it, and they're lining up, and it's a Republican president, and so they don't want to challenge him. And, hmm. and it's Bush, right? Papa Bush, and um, which is another story. Wow, this this could go on and on. I'm sorry, but uh, hmm. and here comes Gore, and he didn't he didn't commit to me that he was going to vote for it, but he said I'll look into this. Right? He was against it when I spoke with him, walks in, he's late and the vote's up and he sits down and he Senator Gore and he said, I, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And right then, Dole, and that, that's enough to get the Senate Select Committee in place. Right then, Dole says, I'm changing my vote. <laughs> Because he's the, he was the chair, right, uh, of this investigation. And and he changes the vote so that it came out as unanimous rather than him being identified as somebody voting against the family. Uh, and and if this is if this is what will set up the then the Senate hearings that will. Yes. Yes. I mean, which have to be very long hearings with all kinds of. So you were, you know, there was sort of the, for lack of a better way of putting it, sort of the POW MIA activist community, you know, the the League of Families and things like that. But you weren't really part of that until Until this series of of events in 1991 sort of pulled you in. What what was it that convinced you over time? You know, because honestly, I'm I'm watching you on C on C SPAN and you're saying, you know, you've got the photos next to one another and you're saying, look at this, look at this, look at this. And I'm thinking, yeah, I, I can see that. Um, what what convinced you over time that the that that it's not your dad in the photo? Because Robertson and Stevens haven't come home and their remains haven't been returned. And they were in different parts of the Southeast Asia. That was one thing that was pretty powerful to me. It's like, I don't know mm. that they were together um, and, oh. and, and in that regard. And then the other thing was that they found, I mean, Deborah Robertson, the found, she yeah. went back to the Soviet Union and found that magazine. Um, and, Different one than the government said. The government immediately pulled one out and said, this is it. She did, and this was like two years after, this was a long investigation by her and her sisters, but she was the one who went to Russia. Yeah, she was the one that tracked it down. And Deborah was, you know what, Al, I don't, I, I, you know, if this was it, real, it would have taken so much for them to have done that. And she wasn't gonna go down that, and I hate to say it because conspiracies do exist, but the way I see conspiracies is a confluence of bureaucratic ineptness and cover up to move on, to move on, you know, to, to let this issue die a natural death. 
because all these men, if they were kept, are so old that they have, I mean, there's no way they could still be alive. Uh, but when we were looking, different story, different story. And were, they shipped to, were they shipped to the Soviet Union? Yes, they were shipped to the Soviet Union. Were they shipped to China? Yes, they were shipped to China. Absolutely. There's just too much evidence to deny that. Um, so, yeah, but that's that's where it came from. And so it takes and I and I owe I owe Colonel Clapper uh, an apology because he came to me and said, now that we've figured this out and looked at this, um, do you believe do you believe uh, that it was real or not real? And I said, look, Colonel Clapper, I, I need to. He was the head of the DIA at the time. I need to talk to the men who were in that photograph. This is how much I need to prove it. Um, I need to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And he looked at me and said, I'm never going to get you that proof, right? You're either going to believe it now or you're not. And then he was really upset with me because uh, mm -hmm. he thought he had done his job and, and I, I refused to accept it. Uh, and, you know, and I can put it now into the passion of trying to find my dad. Because nobody else was looking for him but us. And, and that, that was an abomination. Well, I think the other thing, as you said, just as somebody has to be presumed innocent until they're found guilty, I have to presume my dad is alive until he is proved dead. And when we finally got the information, when people threw in front of Albro a witness statement as he was testifying um, to establish the Senate Select Committee, there's as much information that his father survived as that he could not have survived. It truly is was not definitive. And that piece of that report was a witness statement <laughs> that the U.S. government said didn't exist. And there were four different top secret uh, stamps to release it to me uh, and that it, that it all happened. They knew I was coming. They knew I was setting them up. They knew I was going to be on national TV and then they did it and they dropped a witness statement about my father's loss in front of me in the middle. I mean, it was just time. Another full bird colonel dropped it in front of me. The timing was amazing, you know, to mess me up. I mean, it really, or not, maybe just pure bureaucratic ineptness again, but how it turned out was here I am reading about, Park Bunker, who, you know, is in the book, The Ravens, uh, you know, a Ford Air Controller and another hero who lost his life. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, OK. <laughs> and this yeah. statement said that he got out of the plane, he ejected, he got out of the plane, the chute deployed, that the chute went down that the chute was recovered, the, the harness was recovered and sent back to be analyzed. We've never found that. We have never found the report on, like, was it cut? That would tell us something. If somebody cut themselves out, if it ripped, it had, if it maybe it hadn't been strapped or, you know, there's a lot we could have learned from that. But we've, we've never found that. Looking back now, what is your sense of what happened on December 24, 1970? Hmm. Do, 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 do you think you have a, a, a good understanding? I mean, you know, because um, I've, I've read one thing where um, your dad is reported to say, I've got a rough engine, it's backfiring, which indicates mechanical problems. But then we hear about a guy who apparently with a rifle shot the plane and which could put a, put a bullet in the engine, which would then make, that would make sense. Right. Um, so that's one thing, the chute deployed, but then it seems that somebody said, but the chute, there was no one in the chute or something like that. Dude, what, what is your sense of what happened then after all of this time, um, all of these discussions, all of these interactions with government agencies, other people in the POW MIA community. What, what is your sense of what actually happened on December 24, 1970? And, and that's a tough question from a lot of perspectives. And I thought about it for a long, long time. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my brother, uh, Bill 
or William spending four years uh, in Southeast Asia, wow. going behind the bamboo curtain, getting to the crash site. Uh, and he, he did actually get to the site. I did with him. It was, you know, pure God, how a confluence, again, that's an interesting term now, of events occurred to allow us to get where we got. Uh, I mean, get, we got shot at um, when we were ignoring the Pat that Lao officer and marching off into the jungle of Laos to try and get to this location where he was reportedly held. Um, And so what happened? I don't know. He could have, he, he transferred his planes because he had a, a rough engine, didn't take off. These were old planes, you know, I mean, they were putting them together with, you know, gum and bailing wire. So, uh, and it was, but it was an amazing plane, but as one of his, not his wingman, but one of the bomb loaders, Kathy again, tracked down for us, said to me, he said, Albro, this plane has the glide ratio of a toolbox. Mm. And so if it wasn't under power, it was going down. And uh, one of its weak spots, it was armored on the bottom, but not on the top. And so this fellow, my dad was flying down a canyon, right? And there's this fellow was up above and shooting down at him and hit, obviously hit the oil uh, pump. And that takes out the ability for that engine to operate because obviously it's the hard knock. There's no one down it went. And so 3,300 horsepower in that engine. And so that's, I believe... What happened? And it had a rocket behind. I mean, it was it was modified to have a rocket behind the strat, the pilot seat and shoot out. And so, did he attach himself when he transferred planes? Did he fail to um, uh, hook himself in? My dad was just fastidious as a pilot, fastidious. So, did he do that? I have a hard time believing that. Was he in the plane? Did he get down? Was he now? In the middle of a battle, and the path at Lao, the the royal, um, the North Vietnamese are there. The Royal Thai Army is there. I mean, it's a big, big uh, showdown. And so, did he clip it and take off? Right, I before he landed. I don't know. He tells stories of how the path at Lao would capture the fellow who went down. They kill him. They post him sitting up on a hillside so the men could see him and then they they do target they do target practice at the men coming in to try to rescue him because they turned the beeper on you know and so they had to believe and so did he want to do that i mean did he want to avoid that who knows who knows but we do know that the remains that they returned are his and we didn't believe them because they returned monkey bones they returned all sorts of nonsense but we forced, we forced the Laotian government to do something that was n- never done. Have all the men lost their mouths, right? 496 men. This was unilateral returns of these remains because we were not stopping until we were able to find out without my dad. There was evidence that these remains had been stored, stored. And they're right? very partial remains. They were maybe 11 bones at most. It was yeah. Like- but That's enough from different parts of, of it, the body uh, to uh, say yes, you know, to, for us to say yes. And you had you had a DNA match. We tell him, tell him a story that. about tell him a story about that guy. Well, his father was an only child, and his mother was dead. And the type of DNA that lasts long term is mitochondrial DNA, which is maternal DNA. Right. So, and his grandmother. Albro's father's mother had left her family at 16 and not gone back. So she had been completely cut off. So we, these remains must have been around for like four to five years, just in limbo, because we wouldn't accept what the government said. We had some um, hair and a hairbrush. They wouldn't give us DNA to test. So we started doing research and there is a wonderful, strong community of POW activists and 
um, veterans in the whole Minnesota, Minneapolis area. So mm -hmm. we just put out the word that his grandmother had been from there. Can anybody help us find this family? So they actually helped us reconnect with the mother of Albert's father. And they had said that they waited for her mother had a candle in the window waiting for her to come back home. And, um, and we were able to reconnect, meet the family. One of her sisters had a daughter and we were able to get maternal DNA that we kept. We did not give to the government. Um, and at a certain point, Albo got a phone call from a, a general son who is a general. Is that right? Yes. Albo, mm -hmm. um, who said this phone call's not happening, but if you mm -hmm. will give us the some hair to do a DNA string, we will. My mother had kept a brush. We will give you the DNA string information that you can use for your own independent analysis. And so we never told them about the blood. We did our own, you know, we Albro had a phone call of, well, hello, family. It's so nice to be in touch. So nice to meet you. Can we please get a sample of your blood? <laughs> and they were yeah. very gracious and willing to do that. And so, you know, the, the blood DNA matched the markers in the, the bone that they had. I found the foremost DNA specialist in um, Texas, and, and he wanted to help us, you know, and I, I mean, I paid for the, the processes, but um, he then said, this is exact, you know, because the hair, he extracted from the hair and said, this is exact, they gave us the DNA strands. And that allowed us to say, okay, yeah, you know, he, he, he let's, let's, you know, they brought him home. My uh, nephew was at the Air Force Academy at the time. He escorted his remains home and we had the uh, heroes uh, welcome and the heroes burial at the very same time. I'm going to refer you to a very interesting analysis we've been told. We've been told by um, the uh, Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, the Republican staff, that they're going to bring these documents here. This is the, an examination of U.S. policy towards POWs and MIAs. It's by the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations Republican staff. It specifically addresses what's happening with regard to the technical language that is being used by the DIA in, with respect to live or eyewitness reports. Uh, and exactly what she was told by DIA about Certainly, certainly. I just wanted to get to the answer to your question. And what happens is we have all of these legalistic, really truly legalistic, and I'm an attorney and I, it boggles my mind that they're using these legalistic terminology to phrase eyewitness accounts of people that are over there alive. Well, I happen to be, I'm with the Navy, and it so happens that I was the first one to receive the information through Trowbridge, through the DIA. And uh, when I opened it up, what it said was, we have had a live sighting on Lieutenant Commander Larry Stevens and Robertson. That was in my report. And we had gotten a fax strip of this picture, which did not show the third man. That was the first information that we received. And of course, this is the live sighting report uh, that was the picture that came out. The picture of the live sighting uh, This is a picture that we received through the government. And that first report. How much of this time before Mr. McDaniel became involved? Uh, Brad McDaniels has been involved with trying to find the information on the men for a long, long time. A very long time. So are you saying that the live sighting report is the picture? But I am repeating exactly what they said to me in that report. We have had a live sighting report on Larry Stevens and John Robertson. And that is all. They are following it up. They will follow it up. And we had that bench and then sooner, I mean later than that, then we received this picture. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you are. And when did you get the fingerprints and footprints? The fingerprints came uh, 
I think in the next report, I have to be sure of that, but they came with the letter, supposedly written by our men. There have been no footprints. But no footprints, only a full handprint and fingerprints did we receive, and, and that was sent to us by the DI-8 also. But we haven't been able to verify it because we, had, we cannot get a prince to match them up with. When you my local veteran of foreign wars called me up, the head of my, my local VFW post, and he said, Mrs. Lundy, he said, little lady, little lady, I want you to read this report. It'll make your blood boil. <laughs> and, and so, my, coincidentally, my son had come over, what were we doing, oh, the pictures, and he brought me one. So I tore this apart from Los Angeles to New York. I read it, underlined it, took it apart. And what it did was put in print all the things I had already learned and that I had logically concluded from my own listening and studying for two weeks. They were written here. Unbelievable. Uh, quote, for, this is prologue to part two, page I. Uh, quote, uh, the, blah, blah, blah. Hand, government's, U.S. government's handling of and evaluation of live citing reports. Such accounts are first-hand narratives by witnesses who believe they have seen American military personnel. For Vietnam, the U.S. government has at least 1,400. This is documented. The, the, the committee got this from documents released under the Freedom of Information Act. At least 1,400 such reports, including reports that have been received in 1991. Um, in addition, thousands of second-hand reports. That's somebody who talked to somebody who saw somebody. Yet, now, listen to this. Yet, amazingly, the U.S. government has not judged a single one of these thousands of reports to be credible. Remember, this is based on documents, research. But, ma'am, you realize this is a political document you're holding there. It's not a factual uh, document. I believe, whether or not its purpose is political, that this committee has done its homework. There are footnotes in here. It is related to documents which they have reviewed. In other words, if they, which have been de declassified. So, um, no, I was just, I'll get off here in just a second. Um, the point I'm making is that there has been a policy um, in light of what appears to be a compelling need of the Department of Defense to uphold the no evidence policy. In other words, the slant has been, if we get some information, if we get something, we're not going to go and find it, try to prove it. We are going to be sure we disprove it. And you can find many. The Newsweek article had a case of a lady, I believe her husband's name was Glass, uh, when he was reported to be dead on one set of information, and that was disproved, then we get something else to prove it. And if that's disproved, we get something else to prove that he's dead. In other words, when we talk about highest national priority, I hope that our government, uh, our Congress instructs our president that our policy is going to be reversed. 